One of the clearest, simplest, most direct parts of all of Scripture is the commandment to take care of people who are in need. It, it's just crystal clear. It, it, it's at the very beginning in books like Deuteronomy saying, you got to take care of the people who, who need it. You, got, you have to. It, it shows up in the prophets who show up to call uh, the nation of Israel back to faithfulness to God, and, and their critique sounds a lot like this. The prophet Amos says, you, nation of Israel, you are judged, for you have trampled on the heads of the poor. And that continues, then Jesus shows up, and it continues, and we get things like the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who is the one who, is the, the, who helped? Who is the one, the one who stopped and took care of the neighbor. That's, that's the, your neighbor. That's the one you want to emulate. And, and I cannot tell you how many times uh, I've preached on this. I'm not sure how many sermons you've heard on, on helping your neighbor and reaching out. And it, it comes up all of the time as a Christian. We as a nation, uh, a nation full of Christians, we respond to this by giving. And we give extravagantly. We, we truly do. As a nation, we are in the middle of this 40-year-old sort of charity boom. There's this vast charity boom that's been going on. Over the last 40 years, uh, the rise of the short-term mission trip has got to the point where uh, something like 2 million missionaries go out internationally every year. And 90% uh, of Americans give to charity every year. What else can you get 90% of Americans to do or even agree on? I mean, 90% of Americans believe it is good to give and help, and help people. And so this is, this is great, right? Now, you could be somewhat cynical and, and point out that uh, the percentage that people are giving of their income is dropping. It's now just above 2% of income is what people tend to give. Those 90% 90, 90 of Americans tend to give about 2% of what they make. You could be cynical and say that's kind of depressing, but let me put it in a different way. I'm amazed that we continue to be so generous in light of what we have seen, the results that have happened because of our giving. Let me ask you this. This is the 50th anniversary of uh, Johnson's declaration of the war on poverty. Who's winning? Right? Who's poverty, right? You ever hear, I heard someone say we needed to stop declaring wars on nouns. War on terror, war on drugs, war on pot. You can't beat a noun. It just doesn't work. <laughs> but after years, after 50 years of this war on, on, on poverty, where do we stand? Uh, we don't usually speak of this. We don't usually speak uh, of this, this need to help and work with people in poverty. And I think we avoid this discussion because we tend to divide into two camps and we just don't talk to each other. And I'm going to paint with a very broad brush here. This is almost a caricature, but this is my experience, is that there are folks who tend to lean liberal, who want to help because we have to help. Jesus says help. So we're going to go out and we're going to help people. And then they help people and help people and help people. And then the people don't change. And so they feel like they're getting, they get bitter because I'm helping, but it's not making a difference. And I keep on helping and it's not changing. And, and then it if you've ever heard of the term compassion fatigue, you give and you give and you give and it just doesn't change. And so that's one, one group of people. And then again, with bro painting with very broad strokes, there's the other camp that comes in this, people who tend to lean conservative, who, who say, you know what, people need to stand up and, and, and take care of themselves and be independent and, and, and that's what we need to do. And so I'm going to, I will help people if, if that's what it's going towards. And, and, and you help people, and, and these type of folks tend to help someone and, and you give to them and then they don't change and you expect them to change and they don't change. And then it serves, it serves as confirmation that those who are in need are, are lazy and, and why should I bother helping them because it doesn't make a difference anyways. And it serves as the rationale and, and the confirmation to not bother. Is that about right? Does that sound familiar? depressingly so. Yep, that's what I've heard as well. Um, I'll tell you something surprising about both of these, these groups. They're both doing the same thing. They're, they're interpreting the results differently, but they're both doing the exact same thing. They are practicing charity. And, 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 and in America today, what do we call charity? If I ask you what's charity, what would you tell me? What is charity? Welfare? What, what is charity? A little couple more words. What is it? It's giving. It's helping. So it's giving. And, and when, you, when you practice charity, what do you tend to do? You tend to write a check, hand it over, and then you go home, right? 
Or you, you buy some soup, you drop it off at the soup pan, or the food pantry, and then you charity. This the particular form of charity that we practice is to give of our resources, and then that's it. No strings attached giving. No, no strings attached at all. That, that's what we tend to practice. That's not the only way to think about charity. Charity is a biblical word. If you go back to the King James Bible, it's not faith, hope, and love. It's faith, hope, and charity, right? So charity is a, is a biblical word talking about the, the highest love. But the way that we practice charity in America is a very specific form. And it's, I'm going to write you a check, and I'm going to give it to you and then good luck. That, that's what we call charity. We've been doing that for about 40 years, this big charity boom. How's that working out for us? No, it is not. It is not good. I'm telling you, after studying this and being in the midst of it for a bit now, I, I think what has happened is our charity has become toxic. It has become toxic. It is causing great and vast problems. It's not that charity itself is a bad thing. It is the way that we practice charity is a bad thing. We have to practice charity as followers of Jesus, but the way we have been practicing it, well, has produced some spectacularly bad results. You hold on to that. We're going to get... Yes. <laughs> you don't, that's about five minutes down the road. <laughs> to describe why charity has become toxic... Uh, we need only look at this phenomenon called generational poverty. We, live, we have set up our economy and our culture in such a way that the most determinative factor of your financial future are, are to what parents are you born. If you are born to parents who are married, have income, and have the financial reserves to send you to college, you are great. If you are born to a single mother, usually it's a single parent, a single mother. If you're born to a single mother, working poor, no financial reserves, I mean, that, that's your, you are not likely to get very far, right? And so, once a family is in poverty, poverty is defined right now as making $23,031 $23, for a family of four, which ain't much. Once a family begin, is in poverty, there are some ways that they can receive assistance. And from the government, it's TANF, SNAP, and Section 8. TANF Temporary assistance for needy families is what welfare once was. And TANF is capped at five years, and you have to have kids to receive it, and it's direct monetary payments. Uh, welfare doesn't exist. Now it's TANF. And SNAP, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, is what, once, what, what we once called food stamps. It's not stamps anymore. It's a card. You swipe it. It works like a credit card. You, it, every month you get money to buy food. And then Section 8 is uh, the subsidized housing, subsidized rental. And so people in poverty can either get that type of assistance and they can also get assistance from not-for-profits in local churches, such as monthly food bank runs, free clothes, or adopt a child at Christmas, that type of stuff. What we are doing with these forms of assistance is we're training beggars, aren't we? We're training people to beg. We're training people to show up and to ask for something for free, we're creating a situation in which the incentive is to look as bad as you can. Because if I show up and I look good, you're not going to give me anything. But if I show up and I look bad, pathetic, if I look like I'm in bad shape and I show you my numbers, I'm not making anything, then, then I'm going to get more, right? And so the incentive of our programs is to look as bad as you can because that's the way you'll get as much, as much help as you can. And then kids learn this from parents, and now we have generational poverty. This type of charity, this type of direct giving without strings attached, is toxic furthermore because it creates expectation, right? If I give you a gift once, you're, you're thankful. If I give it to you twice, well, now it's a pattern. I give it to you three times, you think you, need, you deserve it. I give it to you four times, now you depend upon it. You plan for it, right? And so we are creating dependency. You're right, Penny. We got to it. Just took me a minute. And so, uh, and that's toxic because that's how you train someone. You do it again and again and again, and you have trained someone to be a beggar. And then the relationships just get all sorts of messed up because, okay, I'm giving you something. If I give you something repeatedly, I expect something of you, don't don't I? If I expect something of you, what do I expect? Well, whether I tell you or not, I expect you to take responsibility, to, to, to sort of, if you'll, if you'll forgive the gendered phrase, to man up and take, get, step up and do something, right? And yet, you get assistance by acting pathetic. 
And so you're not going to do it. That's not what got you assistance in the first place. Why should you learn otherwise? I, I think the point at which I realized how messed up our practice of charity is in this country is when I found out why we can't do micro-lending. Are you all familiar with the concept of micro-lending? Anyone here heard that phrase? Okay, micro-lending is this idea. It, it's one of the best ideas in the last 30 years, maybe even better than the cell phone. It is amazing. Here's the idea. You go in to a de developing nation, you go into a village, and you find a family, and you, find, and you find someone who is a farmer, and you say, I will loan you 50 bucks so you can buy a cell phone. And that way, you can call the market and know when to show up with your produce, and you'll get a better price, and then you pay me back off the of proceeds, and I get paid back. You've got a cell phone, and you have lifted your family out of poverty. Or you find a, a woman and say, you know what, can you sew? You can sew, okay. I'll loan you 50 bucks. You buy a sewing machine, you pay me back. These, these microloans have like a 98% repayment uh, percentage. And, uh, and then you now have lifted your family out of poverty. Microloans are changing families, changing lives, one little $50, $100 chunk at a time. But you know what it takes for a microloan to work? It takes an intact family to support you while you try something new. And it takes a drive, a work ethic, an entrepreneurial spirit to do it. Well, what don't we have? Generational poverty. Families are broken and the work ethic is fading. So we don't do microloans in America. And that's really kind of depressing. So microloans brings up the overseas thing, right? Overseas, are we, are we doing any better with overseas? America sent $8 billion in assistance to Haiti before the earthquake in 2010. That's the total amount sent in direct charity. The result, the average income went down by 25%. Right? Go us. It, talking to a banker in Nicaragua, I can't say that country very well, Nicaragua? Nicaragua. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, Bob Lupton, this fellow I, I've met, uh, he was talking to a banker in that country and, and asking you do microloans, right? Do you work with other churches? And, and what he said after a while is, that, you know, I don't work with the churches because what the churches are doing is training villages that if you have a problem, the church will show up in, at no more than a year out and solve it for you. So why should they try it? Why should they bother? Why should they take a risk? Why should they take a loan? The church will show up and do it for you. And so what happens, the American model of missions was we go overseas, we spend 30 grand to paint an orphanage or, a, a, or a, a school, when for 30 grand we could send that money over, hire two painters, hire two full-time teachers for a year, and buy them uniforms. Every, every kid in it. And, and so what we're doing is exporting th th this approach uh, of creating beggars. That's not to say that all overseas missions are wrong and problematic, but a lot of them are. A lot of them are. I have become firmly convinced that the American way of practicing charity is just toxic. I also remain utterly convinced that as a follower of Jesus, we must practice charity. It's not often that I put things in black and white terms. This is one of them. If you follow Jesus, you must practice charity. You must be taking care of your neighbor. Period. End of story. There's no dancing around that. And so what we must do, I believe, is figure out ways to love our neighbors in a way that is responsible. What we've been doing is doing charity in a way where it says, you know, I intend good, and here's my check, but intentions don't guarantee that it actually does good. And so I believe that we need to pay attention to charity in such a way that we, it is responsible and we look at what is the result down the road. What, what's the long-term consequence? If I do this this time and again and again and again, what's going to happen? And that's what I want to call this. Instead of toxic charity, let's talk about responsible grace. Grace, it's a gift but it's responsible for what happens next. And so that's our project for this, this month of February. We're going to look at this, and I'm actually very excited about this. And what I want to leave you with today is I'm going to leave you with uh, some got three guidelines for how we can talk about this and, and still be family. It's a contentious topic. I want to give you a very brief snapshot of poverty, and I want to leave you with a question to ponder. 
First, uh, how do we talk about this? This is contentious. We don't talk about it often because we're all kind of set in our ways and we know what we think and well, we have some thinking to do. And so first, I, I'm going to ask that we be graceful with each other. We're family right now. We need to be family at the other end of this. So let's be graceful and, and accept that we all do want to do what's best. And so be graceful. And second, can I just say right now that we're all wrong about something on this? I mean, that, that might not be a fun thing to admit, but I can tell you right now, this last week, I went from, yay, they passed food stamps. Thank God, one in seven Americans on food stamps. I'm glad, to, oh man, I'm not sure food stamps is a good program. It, within the case, within 24 hours, I was doing some reading about it. I might be completely wrong about food stamps. I don't know. I'm going to need you to help me figure it out, right? And so, I might be wrong on some things, and you might be wrong too. I can almost guarantee it. We just got to figure it out, right? And third, let's try to use data. Let's try to use facts. Because we all have the story. We have the story of the person who pulled themselves up from the foot by their bootstraps and they, they took responsibility and they raised their kids and they got their kids into college and they came, came from poverty and they, they changed their world, right? We all know one, one of those stories. We all know the story of the, the person who's at Richardson's and using food stamps to buy 17 cases of Mountain Dew while their three kids don't have any shirts on and it's 20 below, right? We all have, you, there's always an anecdote, there's always a story and, and story, one story here, one story there does not tell the whole picture. We need to look at the whole picture. And so as we talk about this this month, let's be graceful, let's admit we might be wrong, and let's try to stick to data, especially when it comes to government programs, because they have changed. The reforms in the 1990s, early 1990s under Clinton, changed how welfare and government aid works. We all probably need to look at that before we make any assumptions about uh, what benefits actually provides. And second, let me give you now this, uh, just a very brief snapshot of poverty in America. The most at-risk group for being in poverty in America, anyone want to guess? Children. Children. One quarter of people in poverty are children, though elderly is the fastest growing group, 8%, uh, and, and growing because 401ks weren't fully funded and pensions are being slashed. And so one quarter of people in poverty are children, one quarter of people in poverty are working, the working poor, 8% are uh, the elderly. And so I don't think it's possible to say the poor are, insert word here, it, it's just too diverse of a group. You can't just say, it's too complicated, right? People in poverty, if you look at them statistically, they have the same number of children as anyone else in America. They vote the same, their vote breaks down the exact same percentages, Republican, Independent, Democrat. They are less likely to vote, but they vote in the same ways. They are just as likely or less likely to use drugs. And I can tell you that with certainty because of the state of Missouri. Who here knows what we did last year in the state of Missouri for drug tests? Do y'all know this story? The state of Missouri, we spent $493,000 to test people on benefits for drugs. You know how many people we caught? 20. $493 to catch 20 people. Go us. <laughs> Florida and uh, Minnesota did the same thing. They found the exact same statistics. People on benefits are as likely or less likely to be on illicit substances than the rest of the population. And uh, one in seven... As I said earlier, one in seven people in America are on SNAP. One in seven people are getting food stamps, what used to be called food stamps. And that's ugly. And what's even more ugly is to know how much that's increased. In 2008, it was 33 million. Today, it's 47 million people. You talk about the recovery happening and the stock market's doing great. The stock market's doing great for people who own stocks. Real... Um, everyday Americans, there are more people. We've gone from 33 to 47 million people in just five years on food stamps. And then what, uh, what causes poverty most? What causes situational poverty where you fall into poverty? Well, three out of five bankruptcies are due to medical bills. That's what my brother's doing right now. He was, he was joking with me that it's costing him $1,500 to tell the state that he has no money. And that's what it's costing him. But uh, the medical bills, he has insurance. He is gainfully employed by the school. He works for two schools. He has a college degree. He works. He pays his bills, usually. And uh, going bankrupt. And so that's the kind of snapshot of what we're looking at here. 
a little bit more complicated than you might expect. It was more complicated than I expected. In light of all of this rather depressing news, I want to say very clearly that it is my belief that the church holds the key to responding to such a challenge in a way that is not only faithful to the gospel of Jesus, but is also truly transform transformative of those of us who give as well as those who receive. That there are ways we can be graceful in ways that are responsible and that grace does not have to be toxic. This responsible grace is going to be what we are looking at over this month of February. And I invite you to join with me in exploring this further. Uh, if you would like, there is a book on this called Toxic Charity. It's a very quick and light read. If you want me to order a copy of it, uh, I, will, I will get that to you. And I will have it to you by Wednesday. Um, Pam has an extra copy if anyone wants to snag it from her. If reading is not your thing, there, this uh, author, Bob Lupton, did an, uh, a presentation at Manchester United Methodist Church, and I've got the video. If you let me know, I will make you a DVD of what he, he presented, and it kind of lines up with the book. So if you don't want to watch you read a book, I'll give you the video. If nothing else, please, review the, please read the review of the book that's on the back table back there. Grab a copy on your way out. And so that, this is what we're looking at. And, and as, we, as we go forth this week, I want to leave you with this question. I want to ask you what you think about Utah. You see, Utah figured out in 2005 that it was spending $16,670 per person that was homeless on ER and jail, emergency room and jail. That's how much it cost the state of Utah. And they figured they could spend $11,000 and give every homeless person in Utah an apartment and a social worker. And so they did. And homelessness is down by 74%. Is this a good thing? Is this wonderful? Is this the best thing the state's ever done and we need to do it right away, right here? Or is it horrible? Is it disempowering people? Is it destroying lives and creating ghettos? Or is it something else? Is it something in between? What do you think? Come back next Sunday and we'll try to figure it out. Amen.